Um, so, okay. Uh, that's it. Uh, I've been in software development uh, as of this year for 40 years. Uh, the vast majority of that for 25. <laughs> yes, I uh, the first 25, something like that, was working uh, in television and radio. I worked for CBS down in San Diego, uh, automating that business. Um, so I got into this thing about being a consultant and a coach and teaching classes and all that kind of stuff as kind of a secondary career. Um, so my take on things is highly developer centric because that's kind of what I am, kind of always will be. It's just you know, kind of core. Uh, anyway, um, as part of being a net objectives dude, one thing that we have to do um, uh, is public repairs. It's kind of like what uh, uh, university professors do. So I wrote a book called Emergent Design. It came out a couple of years ago. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of bouncing off some of the ideas in that book. Uh, net objectives as a company uh, wrote a book together as a team called Essential Skills for the Agile Developer. We were just always getting these questions about people saying, you know, we're going to go agile, so what's the critical uh, technical practices you need to do that uh, to not get yourself into trouble if you're going to work in an agile way? So we just kind of laid it out, and every chapter is one of those things. Again, some of the things that we'll talk about today are about some of those essential skills. Uh, also, Amir Kolsky and I are working on a blog right now called Sustainable Test Driven Development, which is up and running. Uh, we're contributing to it whenever in our copious free time. But we're hoping that, that this blog will allow us to work out the intellectual property, if you will, that we can uh, write a book on TV. Uh, just because we haven't found the book we like yet, so I figured we'd better write it. Right? Anyway, that's what I'm kind of up to these days. So uh, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to start uh, with what we call dialectic reasoning. This is something that was often called Hegelian dialectic because it was invented by this very um, unhappy looking guy. Uh, George William Friedrich Hegel, who was a German philosopher in the 1700s. Uh, although if you were to ask Hegel, you can't give it, of course, but uh, if you were to ask him uh, whether he came up with this, he would say, no, it's not my idea at all. It's all based on the work of Immanuel Kant, who died when I was about 25 years old. But Hegel was about 25 years old. Something about philosophers, they never want to take responsibility for their ideas. I don't know. Anyway, so dialectic is a way of trying to understand the truth of something. Most philosophers seek the truth. Hegel was about figuring out how we can all seek the truth. And dialectic says, look, figure out what you think is true. That's your thesis, right? Understand that really deeply. But the next thing you need to do is to say, what is the opposite point of view? What is the antithesis? You come to understand that as well as you understand what you believe to be true. And what you'll find is that these two things actually are not completely opposite. That there is some way in which they're actually sort of the same. And when you do that, he would say that you achieve synthesis, which is an integration of both. And the reason you want to do this is because you know, when you start with these two things that are seemingly true, when you go through the process of trying to understand why they're not actually in opposition, you achieve a higher truth. And then, of course, that becomes your next thesis. And you've got to look for the antithesis, and you do again, right? So this is the process of coming to understand the true truth about something. I think it's a really interesting way to think. So I'm going to kind of use that as a background to our thought process. So for instance, here's a synthesis we can achieve. We start with the thesis, right? It says, we're going to be agile. So what's the point in doing a whole bunch of upfront analysis? You know, it's never right anyway. And even if it is, requirements are going to change anyway. So just believe in the process and just believe that when you figure it out, you'll refactor to it later. That's kind of the, the XP kind of approach. Don't do all this upfront stuff, right? Especially when it comes to analysis. Just a waste of time. Okay, the antithesis says, look, you shouldn't build something unless you understand the problem you're trying to solve, right? That's just kind of a, a ham-fisted way to work. So don't play dumb. Don't code in the blind, right? Just take a step back and try to understand the nature of the business business value, how they make their money, what the competitive forces are, all that stuff, so you have a much better chance of delivering high value to the customer. So they seem to be fighting each other, right? The synthesis says, determine the knowns. There are some things you know, so don't pretend you don't, right? But, uh, and, and be guided by them, but defer decisions whenever you can. In fact, there's a, a thing that Martin Fowler says that I really like. I think Martin Fowler, the guy who wrote the refactoring book and a lot of other good books. Fowler says, and this should be a t-shirt, by the way, Fowler says, um, your mother always told you, never put off till tomorrow what you can do today. I'm sure your mother told you that. Fowler says, ignore her. <laughs> put off everything you can. Tomorrow you're, you'll be smarter than you are today. Right? And it's kind of clever, but it also has this little hidden nugget in it, which is put off everything you can. 
So the implication there is there's something you can't, right? So how do we make a distinction between what's safe to put off and what you really have to decide now? If we knew what that was, then the synthesis kind of works. Okay, here's another one. Yagni, right? Good old Ron Jeffries and Yagni. Don't build stuff because you think you might need it one day. Build stuff that you know you need. And Yagni stands for you ain't going to need it, right? That's also something coming from extreme programming in the agile point of view. Because when you build things up front, you make them too complicated and you spend too much time on them, so you end up spending more money than your customer can really afford. Well, that's the thesis. The antithesis says if you don't spend enough time thinking about your design, if you're too ole about it, then often you end up with a design that is either brittle or viscous. Now, just to define that, brittleness is something you've all experienced, especially on legacy code. And that is that you go to make a change in one place, and all of a sudden, all kinds of things break that you didn't think were going to change. Right? It's like a house of cards. Right? You move one card, and everything seems to fall apart. You know the system is brittle when you feel it. And, and usually, you compile like this. Because right? you don't know what you just did. Right? Uh, or viscous is kind of a different problem. They often come together, but not always. Viscous is, OK, I'm not worried that I'm going to break the system by trying to change it. I just know that changing is going to take six months. It's just an incredibly difficult system to change, kind of like trying to slog through some really thick mud. Right? The problem with brittleness is it puts too much risk in the system. And the problem with viscosity is it causes too much waste, because it just takes too long to make even simple changes. So well, I, that, there's some truth to that, right? So the synthesis says, again, design to what you know. But if there are certain things you can focus on, and here I'm going to call them qualities, principles, practices, and disciplines. If you focus on the right things, then maybe you can reduce the risk and the waste of that later change. Because that's really why we want to do an upfront design, is to make later change less risky. Well, if you do it another way, maybe we don't need that. So just like the previous thing, there's a critical thing here we have to agree upon, which is, well, what are those things? What are those qualities, principles, practices, and disciplines? All right, so I'll start by defining what I mean by those terms. And again, it's just the way I'm using the words. So what's a quality? A quality is something sort of atomic about code, something that underlies design, something that's actually a, an essence of the code. We want to focus on certain things that have to do with specifically reducing the risk and waste of not over-designing. So we could focus on a lot of things here, but I'm going to nail down four as being really essential here. The first, and again, we need names for these things. So the first is cohesion. When I say cohesion, what I mean is that a thing has kind of a singleness about it. Like a class, for instance, you might say has a single responsibility. It might have a lot of stuff in it, but it has everything it has is because of that one responsibility it holds. Or as Bob Martin says, a class is cohesive if there's only one reason you'd ever want to change it. Or if there's only one thing that could ever really fail about it. So we like that. We like that singleness. When it comes to classes, we focus on responsibility. When it comes to methods, we focus on function. The method should have a single function. This keeps you from writing these you know, big, long methods that do 17 different things. We want to break the problem down functionally into decomposed methods. So that's what cohesion is about. Coupling, of course, is something we always have to be concerned about because when you build a system, you always interject dependencies into the system. And of course, that's unavoidable, right? Because a system, basically, especially in an object-oriented language, is the coupling between the objects. That's what forms the system. So it's got to be there. But we also know that there are times when it's not right, that you know you make a change, and again, this brittle thing, uh, the coupling creates that brittleness, right? Because the change propagates through the coupling to different parts of the system. So coupling is both a thing you have to have and the thing that can hurt you. So obviously, the answer is you've got to somehow get that right, the right coupling, not too much, not too little. The third thing we're really going to focus on is making sure that we don't have redundancies in systems. Redundancies basically are anything that if you went to change it, you'd have to change it in more than one place. Um, the most classic example of paying inadequate attention to this quality uh, is Y2K. Y2K was not a, a question of, of a complicated issue, right? Two digits, four digits, I wouldn't call that rocket science. But the problem was it was in millions of places. So when you, we've decided we would made the wrong decision, it needs to be four digits, we had to change it in millions of places. Not only did this take a long time, but also the concern that we might miss a place made us go slow. So this just basically ended up costing billions of dollars. And who knows 
what else we might have been doing for those two or three years, right? So opportunity <coughs> cost is very high here. So we want to make sure that we don't do that in our systems. And then finally, um, encapsulation, which is really what kind of led to the creation of objects, is the desire to create scope whenever you need to. Encapsulation simply means hiding one thing from something else. A lot of times people think of encapsulation as strictly the hiding of data and functionality, but really it's the hiding of anything at all. And whenever you hide something, that means that thing is not going to be vulnerable to a side effect when you change something else later on, because the encapsulation will protect you, kind of watching your back, right? So these are the qualities I'm going to focus on. What's a principle? A principle is some general bit of guidance, usually that comes from people that came before us, that can show up in many, many, many different ways in a system, uh, and that has some kind of essential benefit to it. Uh, when something is a principle, it doesn't show up in a particular way, and there may be actually times when you can't adhere to it. Uh, but whenever you don't adhere to a principle, you always know that you've encountered a risk there. So an example of a principle from, from life. Um, how many people here have children? Okay. So there's a lot of things you have to teach your ch children about the good people, right? But at some point, most parents realize, you know, if I could just get them to follow the golden rule, that covers most of it, right? I don't mean he who has the gold makes the rules. I mean the other one. Uh, treat people the way you want to be treated, because that's most of the legal system. That's most of good behavior. That's most of being polite. Y your kids won't steal from people. They don't want to be stolen from. Your kids won't bite other children. They don't want to be bit, right? It doesn't cover everything, because like no kid cares about table manners, right? Uh, but it's kind of the, the large issue here. And of course, there are times when you're not going to be able to follow that, because there are times when somebody deserves something to happen to them that you don't, right? So anyway, principles live at that level. So the one I'm going to focus on here is called the open-closed principle. Uh, this was based on the early thought of a guy named Ivor Jacobson, who eventually became one of the people who invented objects and OO and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he said, all systems change during their life cycles. This must be borne in mind when developing systems expected to last longer than the first version, which I would say is systems. I think everything is expected to last beyond the first version. So uh, Bertrand Meyer came along and basically coined this phrase. He said, software entities should be open for extension, but closed to modification. And this is attributed to him, although, like Hegel, he says, it's not my idea. It's Ivor's idea. So what does that mean? It means that one thing that makes a design good is that later, when, say, you need to add a feature to that system, that you're able to do that pretty much by just putting the new feature into the system. But all the stuff that's there already, all the code that currently exists, you want to be able to just not touch it. Right? So that's what's open for extension. I added something new, but closed to modification. I didn't have to change any of the stuff that was already there. And of course, we, we kind of know that's a good idea because that's pretty much what we'd rather do, right? I mean, who here, if you had a choice between working on a greenfield system, you know, just writing it from the ground up, uh, or modifying this gigantic old legacy system. Who would choose the legacy system? <laughs> Obviously not, right? Because you know, there's danger there. There's danger of, of removing value, of introducing defects, and all that kind of stuff. We don't like changing old code. It's just, it's not fun, for one thing. And secondly, it's dangerous. Well, if you're working on a greenfield system, there's nothing to change, right? Because there's nothing there. You're going to build everything. And we just know that's the game we want to play. So for an example of open closeness, I'll use a design pattern. I'll pick one that most of you probably know because it's one of the simpler ones. This is the strategy pattern. The strategy pattern, if you don't know what it is, basically says, if you have some kind of object with a responsibility, uh, let's say this is, um, oh, this is going to serialize uh, some kind of data. And there's something about it which varies. So maybe we're going to serialize sometimes using XML, and sometimes we're going to serialize using UU encoding, right? Um, so if, there, if there's a, a variation in it, you could put a switch in here, right? Saying uh, switch on uh, serialization type, and then you have like case UU encode, case XML. But if you don't want to do that, you could accomplish the same thing by pulling the operation, in this case, Marshall, right? Uh, into a, an interface with two different implementations. This would be, say, UU encode. This would be, say, XML. And we can delegate from here when you need to make that decision. So since these two things will cast up to this interface, then there's no knowledge over here. And there needs to be no knowledge over here as to exactly which form of, of this uh, 
character serialization we're using. Now the reason that's open and closed is because since there's no coupling here, that means we're free to add another one later on. Maybe we're going to use XHPC or something like that in the future. We don't have to change this guy when we do that, so that's how it's open and closed. By the way, we don't have to change this guy, this guy, or this guy either, so there's a lot of value to this. Now because it's a principle, I want to make it clear, this is not the open and closed principle. This is an example of open closeness having to do with a new type. But if you think of all the different things that sometimes you have to do to an existing system, there's an open closed version of that. And each of those things is a design pattern. It's one of the reasons the patterns are what they are, is because we need different forms of open closeness. Remember, Ivor came up with this before there were objects. So this is kind of what led to a lot of things that ended up in OO. So that's a principle. And can you do that all the time? Is there nothing that's ever going to be changed? When I add a type, no, but you look for ways to get as much of it as you can. Okay, what's a practice? A practice, the way I'm using the word again, is something which we have decided we're just going to do. We're just not going to ever not do head again uh, because it's a really valuable thing. Uh, it's always the right thing to do, and it always matters. Every complicated activity that people engage in has its practices. Um, so from non-software, we could say that Sterilizing instruments is not a case-by-case -case decision for a doctor, right? Uh, they all believe in that. Uh, they didn't, not that long ago, the American Civil War, they didn't believe in sterilization at all. And more people died in hospitals than on the battlefield as a result. So once they figure that out, that's not an option anymore, right? Some doctors don't say, oh, I don't have time, <laughs> right? Because they'll kill their patient. Uh, or uh, all, doc all lawyers retain all documents. You don't throw a document away. You might archive it, but every document gets kept. If your lawyer is destroying documents, you got a crooked lawyer, right? Because they just don't do that. Uh, if you're going to do woodworking and you need to make a cut and you're going to measure for the cut, you always measure twice. It's called measure twice, cut once. Woodwork woodworkers always do that because it's a simple thing, but it keeps you from making a mistake and you can't uncut wood. <laughs> so, in order for something to be a practice, you want it to be simple so it's easy to kind of promote across the team. You want it to be low cost because you're committing to doing it all the time. So you don't want it to be something that's going to burden you or give you a bunch of work to do. Uh, and it has to be valuable. There's got to be a reason why you do it. And again, because of the simplicity and low cost, it means the whole team can adopt it uh, without this being a big magilla, right? Okay. So here are two practices we're going to focus on in this idea of, of this synthesis. One is called programming by intention, and the other is called encapsulate construction. So we'll take them one at a time. Programming by intention is a pretty simple thing. Uh, it was one of the 12 practices of extreme programming that came out in 94, 95, when the XP guys came along and said, hey, maybe we should rethink the way we're doing stuff, right? Maybe the waterfall is not such a good idea. So they came up with these 12 practices, and this is one that I really kind of stuck with because it does seem to help a lot, and it's real simple. So let's say you've got a class called transaction, and the whole purpose of this class is to be able to encapsulate and commit some kind of transaction. So you've got a, a method called commit, and it's going to give you a result, a true or false, whether this succeeded. Programming by intention says, look, one thing that you probably know better than anything else as a software developer is code writing, because that's probably where you started. Most developers start by learning language, right? So one thing you become good at is what languages force you to do, which is functional decomposition. Take a problem and break it down into its steps. That's essentially what a program is, is a broad problem broken down into its steps. So that part of your brain is pretty good at doing that, right? So programming my intention says, let that part of your brain lead the way. You say to yourself, okay, uh, I'm going to have this result to return, but how am I going to get it? So let's say the first thing I know I need to do is I need to take this string and I need to break it up into the tokens. I need to tokenize it, right? Because let's say that's what this thing is based on, is tokens. Well, programming my intention says, rather than writing the code to do that, you're going to pretend that you already have a method that does that. It's not true, but you're going to pretend that it's true, and you're going to call it from here. And you decide things like, you know, what does this take as a parameter? Well, it takes a string. That's what I have. Hey, it's handy. Uh, what does it give me back? This array of tokens, right? Because that's what I'm looking for. Now, again, since this doesn't exist, you could say anything you wanted, right? You're not bound by any reality. Very importantly, programming by attention says, just assume that works. Ask yourself, and don't stop here and go try to write it. Ask yourself, what's the next thing I need to do? So maybe there's a business rule about we uh, commit this transaction one way if it's large and another way if it's small. Well, what does it mean for it to be large? 
Is that a large number of tokens? Is it that the tokens are, in average, large tokens? Is it that they are complex on average? What does it mean for it to be large? I don't know. This method knows. So I pass it the tokens and say, tell me if it's large, whatever that means. And then if it says yes, of course, I'm going to commit it the large way. Well, again, I've got a method that does that. I don't have to worry about that now. This method will know what it means to commit a large transaction. And if it's not large, well, then I'll do it the small way, whatever that is, right? So why do this? Well, first of all, it's easy, right? The code that you're going to write when you do implement this method, because obviously you're going to have to, is the code you would have written right here. You're just writing it at a different point in time. So this isn't asking really anything of you. It's not hard. Uh, but look how nice and clean the code is. It's really easy to read. You'll notice that you don't need to put comments on the code to explain it because these names of these methods tell you what the method does, right? And I'd rather have a method name tell me what a method does than a comment because comments, as we all know, get old, right? So after a while, they're just not telling the truth anymore. People will change the code and neglect to update the comments. It happens all the time. So this is better because it's going to stay real, right? Uh, also, each of these methods, remember I said I want methods to be about just one thing at a time? Because I think about one thing at a time, that's my intention, right? Uh, then these methods are doing one thing, because I was thinking about one thing when I created the method. So that's programming my intention, and it's just a good way to write code. By the way, if, if you have anybody who's like, you know, like you're their mentor, and they bring you a like 30-page method, and say, what do you think? Uh, don't yell at them. <laughs> just teach them to do this, right? For one thing, that'll automatically keep that from happening. And secondly, you're their hero now, because this is a way more fun way to write code. You just feel confident about what you're doing. That's programming by intention. Simple then. By the way, it's also open closed. Because if somebody comes along later and says, oh, you know what? Before we decide whether this is a large transaction, we've got to look at all the tokens and make sure they conform to a rule, say a, a case rule, or that they're all legitimate, or whatever. So in other words, we need token normalization before we commit to a large or small process. This is something we forgot, right? Well, when we add that, we add a method, but we don't touch any of the other methods. That's because of the cohesion here. So open close doesn't necessarily mean adding an object, it just means adding something without having to change the other things that were already there. So that's another benefit of program by intention. Yes? There are other contexts in which it, say, for a temporary, a certain period of time, it doesn't work so well. Are there, like that approach, it doesn't work. Let's say you're just not familiar with the domain. Let's say I didn't really understand what tokenization was. Let's say I'm still new to transactions. Let's say even down to the sort of the atomic concepts of what you have up there, well, I don't even have the vocabulary yet, so how am I going to go and say, my intention is to tokenize, my intention is to... Let, let me defer the question because we're going to talk about the factoring a little bit later, and I think that might apply to what you're asking. So let's just wait and see if it does. Okay. Okay, the other practice is something called encapsulating the constructors. This is a really simple thing that allows you to promote a good thing in code, which is separating the way things are made from the way that they are used. There are design patterns that do this. They're often called the creational patterns or the factories. But they're not always worth it. Sometimes it's a real simple thing. So how can you just generally separate use from creation in a really easy, straightforward way when you don't have enough motivation to use some kind of a factory or something? By the way, uh, I, I have a 90-minute presentation on just this. <laughs> so we're not going to cover this very deeply. And there are probably going to be some, well, what about this? What about that questions? Don't have time for it. I'm just going to show this in the simplest form. Uh, I've got another presentation that I recorded, actually. Uh, and I'll show you where you can listen to that later if you're interested in this topic in a deeper way. So I'm just going to show it simply here. Basically, if you have this really simple relationship between two objects, this is the client object, which I've actually named the client. And this is the service object. And this is just doing something for this object. A real commonplace thing to do is to simply build an instance of what we need and then during our operation delegate to it because you're the, you're the service, right? So okay, let's say it's, it's a real simple thing. This isn't doing very much. And this isn't doing very much. We just decided to pull it out because we want to reuse it or we want to test it by itself or we just think it's more cohesive or whatever. Um, but we just don't have a reason to like being using a factory or anything because that's all it is, right? It's just a simple object. A good thing to do is to say, rather than doing this, let's do just a little bit more. Let's do this. Let's actually call get instance from the client and put the new there. We're just moving the new from here 
up to here in this static method. But that doesn't seem like we did anything at all, right? It's just delegated one level to one method, which is all that method does, right? So what's the point? The point is that we decoupled something. It's a little bit um, subtle at first, but the client here is coupled not only to the service, but to the fact that service is a concrete object, because it has to be to call new on it, right? This is not only decoupled the client from potentially what service actually is, as I'll show you, but from the fact that it's concrete. It is concrete, but it wouldn't have to be to support a get instance method, right? You can do that on an abstract type as well. That, that little bit really kind of helps us because, well, first of all, that this stays like this for the rest of my life, what did it cost me? A line of code, right? No big deal. Uh, and a slight change to code, again, no big deal. But if later I want to do something like insert a strategy pattern, maybe I didn't understand the domain very well, and so I realized, oh, you know, there's variations here I didn't see. Or maybe later on the variations show up. There weren't any now, but later there are, right? That can happen too. Then I'm going to be glad I did this because I can make what used to be the service into the interface. This is an extracted class. Extract class is a pretty easy refactor. Uh, that is what this used to be. And this is the new version of the service, whatever that is, which is totally added, so it's open closed. But all I have to do now is change the way get instance is implemented, right? Delegating to a config or reading off a GUI or whatever it is that makes this decision for us. The clients now really are oblivious to this change. So that's a real simple thing, but and many times I've seen it very powerful because, and I'll show it a little bit later, doing even more than this. It means we don't have to know everything when we start. And of course we don't. That's another practice. I don't put new all over the place anymore. I use get instance instead. Okay. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who would make the suggestion that instead of using new in a in, in where you had it before, but creating this new static method called get instance, that how would you, what would you say to them that that's not gold plating? They would say that that's well, you don't need it yet. The agony. Because it's so little work. There's almost nothing done here and yet it's empowering. I, I like those little inflection points where you can make a little tiny change in something and all of a sudden a lot of other things get easier. I think that's what means, that's what allows you to follow GAGP is because you don't have to overbuild everything. This just makes me, one of the reasons people overdesign things is fear, right? They're afraid that later if I try to put it in, I can't. I have no fear here. So that keeps me from not putting an interface in when I don't need it or using a factory when I don't need it. So I think it actually make, allows us to follow GAGP, which is what we want to do. Okay. Now, what's a discipline? That's, we're going up the levels here, right? A discipline is something that is a general and shared approach to doing work. It's something which, as a team or organization, we said, this is something that we're going to use in our process. A discipline is not like a practice in that it's not an easy thing to do. It's something which requires a lot of training, requires a, a, a commitment of time and effort, uh, but it's so important to us that we think it's worth it to do this. So two that we focus on in net objectives, two of the things that we do a lot of training on, probably the most training on, are two things. And by the way, also, once you adopt a discipline, it gives you kind of a professional language, a way to talk to each other that has a lot of fidelity in it. So one of them we call pattern-oriented development. Now why pattern-oriented and not just design patterns? We don't believe that learning the patterns per se is really gonna help you that much. A lot of people know what the patterns are, but if you ask them what they're using them for, they can't really give you an answer. In fact, most people will say, I don't use them that much, just every once in a while, right? It's because the patterns themselves is not where the power of design, the design pattern movement is. It's about how it affects everything that you do. And sometimes most importantly, how the patterns work together, which the gang of four didn't spend a lot of time on, almost none. So that's really what our training is all about. That's why we call it pattern orientation. Just like object orientation, is the powerful part of objects, right? Pattern orientation is the powerful part of patterns. I'll show you one example of what I'm talking about. The other thing, which is a big topic for us as teachers, but also just for our industry, is of course test-driven development. That's the thing that's kind of driving a lot of people today. But by test-driven development, I don't just mean upfront testing. I mean that the tests we write are intended to form an executable specification. And when you think about them that way, you write them really differently. You write different tests. There are things you don't test that you otherwise would have. There are tests you write that you wouldn't have written. And you almost always write the test differently when your purpose is to form an executable, executable specification. 
Also, the reason you're writing them is not just to document, but to drive development forward. Each test is now a definition of code you have to write. Right? So that's what we mean by test-driven development. Okay. So let me show you what I'm talking about on this one first. This is the first design pattern I ever learned, because I had to. Uh, there was a weird new language that was coming out around 1994, 1995, called Hot Java. Anybody remember that it used to be called Hot Java? It was Hot Java for about three months. <laughs> Luckily, they dropped the hot, because that's kind of stupid. Anyway, um, I was learning this language because uh, it was the new thing, and I thought it would be cool to learn it. And they said, well, the way we're doing streaming in this language uh, is we actually have different objects that can receive streams. You know, TCP IP file could be a, um, a socket, could be a, a pipe, you know, different streams. But all these things we sometimes want to do to data before it gets to the sink, those are separate objects. So this will convert your data to Unicode. This will compress it. You could have a buffer, or you could have well, a little bunch of them, right? And in Java, and also in now .NET, uh, the way that we do that is by using this thing called the decorator pattern. These are the unadorned streams. These objects can be essentially layered on top of those objects, so you're speaking through them, and you just pick the ones you want to put in the layer, and you'll get those effects, right? And in the book I was reading, it said, for instance, a good way to open a file in Java is this, right? Because you're building this object, then you're giving it a reference to this object, then this object, which has the information needed to create a proper file, right? So we'll be talking through those, kind of like this. One of the nice things about it is that the client only sees one thing, stream, even though there's more than one thing going on here that's invisible to the client. So he just says, you know, hey stream, uh, you know, flush this for me. Now because it's a Unicode converter, that's what it does, and that's all it knows, it's just that one thing. Uh, and then this thing compresses it, because he was given data, and that's what he always does. And then this guy just says, oh, whatever I'm given, I write down to the file. It happens to be compressed Unicode, right? But it wouldn't have to be. So this creates a lot of flexibility. But how is it open closed? Okay. So one thing I liked about this immediately was the fact that this is not sealed or final, whichever they call it in Java, I was forgetting. Uh, and that means we can add more. And I was working in broadcasting, right? So there are things you do with data in broadcasting that generally people don't do. It has to do with radio signals and other stuff. So whenever I had something like that that I do a lot, but nobody else in other domains do, uh, I could create a new decorator and essentially extend the language into my problem domain, make it the broadcasting version of Java, if you will. And I really like that. So I've had some great idea that's not in the language. I could make Scott's great idea, right? This new decorator. And I thought that was really a nice thing. So we're open closed, essentially, to a new decorator. But that's just the surface. We're open closed to a lot of things now. For example, that this client has this chain of objects, and I decide to change my mind. Maybe Scott's great idea should work on the compressed data, not on the uncompressed data. Maybe that would be more efficient, right? I can do this. Fine, didn't care. I'm open close to that change, too. Or maybe I don't want to do this at all sometimes. So I take that object out. Again, same client code, right? So we're open close to more things than we realize. And these are all changes, right? But they're all changes that don't require change for this code. So that's kind of one little example of what I mean by pattern-oriented. It's seeing patterns in this way. You know, what about test-driven development? What makes a process test-driven? What does it mean test-driven? The first thing is that the test cases give us information about the development process. They tell us whether we understand the problem domain well enough. It's hard to write a test for something you don't understand, right? Because tests are very unforgiving. But also, test-driven is not only development, it's also design. So if the design of our solution is wanting or lacking, you're going to find, find that that creates a lot of pain in testing, because bad design is also hard to test. So it's just giving us information about whether our analysis is complete or good enough, uh, and whether our design is of high quality. Also, the test cases are, again, tells us what code we have to write. And if the test cases are satisfied, and if all the requirements have a test, that's the definition of done. So it kind of is our process control as well. And finally, when we're done with TDD, we don't throw the tests away. Why would we? It's kind of stupid, right? So we keep them around. And what they form is a kind of documentation of the intention we had at the moment we created the production code. That's what I mean by test over the go. I mean, it's a lot more to it than that. I will class it. But uh, that's the essence of where we begin. 
So, again, I make a distinction here between test driven and test first. Writing your tests before your code is not a bad idea. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Uh, and it's a natural fit to TDD. It fits right in. But if you're writing your test first, that, to my mind, does not necessarily mean you're doing TDD. You may, you may not. It depends on what other things you're doing. So, for instance, you have to be managing dependencies on your code. If you're not doing that, I don't think you're doing TDD. Your tests are not going to be nearly fast enough for one thing. Uh, if you are not writing the test specifically with that in mind, you're not writing them the way that they form a specification, I don't think you're doing TDD because they won't have that second value later on. And if you don't have a way to discipline, a disciplined way to refactor your code, then I don't think you can do TDD either because when the tests give you information about the design being lacking, you need an efficient way to change it, right? And that means you have to be able to refactor. There's a lot of other things you have to know in this realm too, like mocking and dependency injection and endo testing and there's a whole bunch of stuff, which is basically testing technique. And you gotta know all that, otherwise you can't do this part. Okay. I think of TDD as including refactoring for that reason. And refactoring, eh, very seminal book, been around for a while. How many people have this book? Good on you, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's an important one, I think. He calls it improving the design of existing code. But notice that Refactoring is a very specific thing. It is change that preserves behavior. A lot of times people use the word refactoring when they just mean they're changing the code, right? And I think that's unfortunate because that can be very misleading. So if you are adding a feature to the code, you're not refactoring it because you're changing its behavior. If you're performance tuning the code, you're not refactoring it, you're tuning it because you're changing its behavior. If you just put a bug in the code, you're not refactoring it because you change this behavior, right? So it's got to be same outward effect, same test passes before, but the quality of the design and the code is better. So even if these two things are true, but you didn't make it better, it's not refactoring either. Okay. So here's the thing I wanted to get synergy on, the thing I wanted to achieve synthesis on, using all of what I just said as background. Patterns are often seen as being from the past. Right? The book was written in 1994. Everybody back then pretty much believed in the waterfall. It was just starting, the ice was just starting to be broken on that because of guys like Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries and Extreme Programming and all that. Um, and so, you know, maybe we can just leave them alone now because we've moved on, right? That's part of the old world. And the new world is, of course, Agile. And TDD is all a part of that. TDD came, grew up with the Agile movement, right? So these are seen as two opposing points of view. Thesis from the past, antithesis from today because you know we've learned and we're smarter. Right? So what's the synergy here? That's really what emergent design is. So what I want to do is to examine synergies between the pattern way of looking at things and the test driven development way of looking at things and then put it to use. <coughs> so for one thing, in patterns, they promote code quality. All the patterns, if you implement them well, you're going to end up with high quality code inside. Well, Testability is a sign of code quality. It's very difficult to test bad code. Question. So is that just a historical sort of fact that they're just opposites? Well, I don't think they are. That's what I'm going to. I think no, they're no, thought of. You about. commented that it is seen as. I hear it a lot. I hear it a lot from people. Sort of yeah. like in passing from people. Why would I do? Why, I don't need no patterns. I do TDD. Or I don't need TDD. I know patterns, right? It seems like they're two camps. I don't think they are, is my point. That, that's kind of where I'm going. So uh, what does this mean? Okay, let's look at the strategy pattern again. The qualities we talked about were cohesion, coupling, encapsulation, and non-redundancy, right? So, well, we got a lot of cohesion here. This guy's not trying to do both things. He's doing his thing and deferring the other thing to somebody else. These guys are only about one version of whatever this is, not everything in one place. So that creates that kind of singleness that we like. We we'll call it cohesion. We have decoupling here because the context object here does not even see these types at all. So are, is there a variation here? I don't know. How many variations are there? I don't know. That's why you're open closed. Because I don't see it now, so I won't know when it's different. We have encapsulation here. I can make a change to this code, and there is no chance that it will affect this code, and vice versa. If they were two legs of a switch case statement, they'd be in the same scope, right? So this puts them into their own individual <laughs> encapsulated scope. And you may have noticed to do this that the operation here has to be publicly available. If this was an algorithm inside this object, I probably would make it private. 
but I'm forced to make it public by pulling it out. What's good about making it public? If anybody else needs to do whatever this is, they won't have to redundantly implement it because this is now a reusable service. So that helps get rid of redundancies. All the patterns do that in different ways. Okay, well, how does testability relate to quality? Well, you may have noticed this. If you've ever tried to do TDD on legacy code, uh, it's really hard because bad code is painful to write tests for. Typical objections we get when we're saying you ought to test your code is, well, look, I can't test this class by itself. I've got to bring up half the system to test it. And the test is really hard to write, and it's really clumsy, and it's slow, right? But really, that's a coupling problem. Because if you have to bring up half the system to test this class, that means you could break half the system if a defect is introduced into this class, which is exactly what we don't want, right? And that means change is going to be like this again. So maybe that's your problem, and the testing is telling you that all pain is diagnostic, right? It tells you something's wrong. Or if the class is weakly cohesive, it's doing a lot of unrelated things. The real problem with that is all of those things are being done in the same scope. So that means there's all kinds of possibilities for side effects that can step on each other's state and all kinds of problems like that. If you know that's possible and you want to make sure it doesn't happen, you're going to have to write tests that prove it doesn't happen. These are called combinatorial tests. Often you write more of them than you do of the tests that are driving the code forward. If you've ever had a class that's of reasonable size, but the test class is huge, <laughs> it's because you've got a lot of negative scenarios you have to test. That's because the class isn't cohesive. It doesn't have enough scope separation. And the one thing that almost always seems to happen is, you know, when we do red-green refactor in TDD, we include the refactoring of the tests, because they sometimes get quality problems, too. If you end up noticing that your tests are full of redundancies, you definitely should refactor them. And there's often refactorings you can do on tests to eliminate the redundancies, but sometimes they don't work. When do they not work? It's when the real redundancy is in the system and you just missed it. Right? But it's going to show up again in the test every time. This is called the persistence of redundancy. Once it's there, it just keeps showing up over and over again. Well, the tests often are a much clearer view of the redundancy than they are in the system. It's your second chance to see it. So they're both about quality. What's another synergy? Patterns, for me anyway, not for the game before, but for me, include how do you test this pattern. I figured out, once we figure out how to test a pattern, like a bridge or a visitor or whatever, why should I have to figure it out again? So to me, that's part of the pattern now. Well, you can also, when you refactor, which is part of TDD, you almost, well, not always, but you very routinely are going to end up in a design pattern. In fact, a lot of the refactorings are named for the pattern you end up in. There, one of them is called replace uh, conditional with strategy, right? Well, strategy is a pattern. So let me show you an example of this first. Our decorator friend again, right? You might think, OK, well, what am I going to do to write tests for these guys? I can kind of see writing tests for these guys because they have the dependency. But these guys have to decorate something, right? And whatever that something is, is going to receive the result of their behavior. I've got to write a test to make sure it's the right behavior, but there could be a lot of combinations here, right? All you really got to do is create a mock stream. And then you can chain each of these decorators with the mock. Because what the mock can do is basically allow the test to have a record of what happened to it when the original the main object was asked, asked, yeah, asked to act. So I can use the same mock to test them both. I can say, all right, uh, here's some data, you can compress it now. And then we just go to the mock and say, what data did it give you? And check to see if it was properly compressed. We use the same mock and say, okay, I'm going to chain you with the Unicode converter now. Here's some text that's not Unicode. Now go to the mock after the test is over and say, what text did it give you? Was it properly converted to Unicode? I can do that with every one of these decorators. Now, that might not occur to you immediately, but once it does, it becomes part of the pattern. So going the other way, well, as I said, refactoring very routinely leads to patterns. In fact, it's so routinely that there's a whole book about it called Refactoring to Patterns. And in this, he really goes into deep detail about the connection here between the desire to make something testable and the result in the design pattern. So obviously I'm not going to get into any details here because that's a long topic, but it's well understood. Okay, what's another synergy? Patterns help to communicate intent. If you learn patterns the way I'm talking about them, and everybody on the team knows the patterns, then when you say something like bridge, or adapter, or facade, or proxy, or whatever, 
Everybody knows what you're talking about. They know kind of what problem you were solving because they know what kind of problem that pattern solves. They know what it's open closed to because every pattern is open closed to different things. They know how we're going to test it. Uh, they know where its, it's uh, possible extension points are. All that information is just contained in the word. So one of the maybe biggest values of a team learning design patterns is how much better their communication is after they're done studying them together. Well, tests do the same thing. Tests basically form a kind of specification of your intent. Let me show you what I mean by that. I mean, specification, right? You want to do that. You want to be able to record somewhere your knowledge of the system so that later on, when you come back to the system, you can reabsorb that knowledge because maybe you went out and did something else for a while. But traditionally, we'll do something like this, right? We'll have a UML diagram or we'll have some kind of document that says, oh, you know, this is an asset and we're going to amortize the value over a number of years and, and this is the algorithm we use to amortize and here are some of the rules about how you use this object. I mean, you write all that down, right? And that has value, certainly, because it informs us while we're making the system. The problem is it loses value quickly because when you come back in six months, are you going to trust it? Are you? We usually throw them away <laughs> because it's not just that this could have changed. The system could have changed and this did. It. It's that there's no way to know, right? So you just can't believe it. So it doesn't have any value later on. These things take work to create. If you're just going to throw them away, you're wasting developer days. I don't think that's a good idea. Well, see, this could be the same thing. This could be the functional spec as well, because it gives you the same information. It says, what does it mean to write it off, right? It's a straight line algorithm. OK, now I get it. Uh, what are the types we're talking about here? How do you make one of these objects? How do you talk to one of these objects? What's the precision? All of this information that would normally be in the spec can be in the test if they're written that way. And the nice thing about this is I can tell you instantly whether this is still accurate to the code, right? Because I just run the test. If it still compiles, APIs are the same. If it still passes, behavior is the same. If the coverage is where I left it, nobody's not played nice and wrote some code and didn't write a test. And I know that by pushing a button. So that gives much more persistent value. These things take work too, but at least we don't throw them away later. Why would we? Another synergy is that all the patterns are open closed. I showed you just a couple of examples, but when I do pattern training, we really focus on this. Every pattern is open closed to different things, but they're all <laughs> open closed. Well, you know, if you want to do TDD and you want your test to be fast, you need the system to be open closed. Because when you're open closed, it means that you can inject polymorphism whenever you need it. And polymorphism is important to testing because one of the forms of a polymorphic entity can be the mock. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to manage your dependencies. So this aspect of patterns makes this way easier. Patterns help your TDD. And the last one before I kind of show you this is uh, good design. I'm sure you've noticed this. A really good design kind of fits the problem, right? When you're struggling with the design, usually it's because somebody kind of forced the design on the problem. But good design is just a reflection of the problem that you're solving. And patterns really lead you to that if you learn how to use them properly. The thing is, testing is also about the problem domain. Because, again, you can't write a test for something that you don't have enough deep knowledge on. So tests kind of hold your feet to the fire and say, do you really know this problem? Both about the same thing again. So all of these synergies, I've given one name, which I'm calling emergence. So let's talk about that, and then I'll show it to you, and then we'll take questions. Here's the thing. Software has no inherent value. Software, in fact, is really a virtual thing, right? So if if a piece of software is not installed somewhere and running, it doesn't even really exist. It's just a potential. So the value of software is completely based on the effect it has on people and business and life and culture and all of that. The thing is, the needs of the world are changing all the time. And in fact, uh, I would say we're changing faster all the time. So in order for software to keep the value it had when you built it, you have to change it. You have to be able to change it or it becomes irrelevant. So that means that software is always, like it or not, in a state of evolution. We, we never done, are done either because the world just doesn't stop changing. So the dis disciplines, principles, practices, and qualities are what make that evolution possible. So let me show you what I mean. We have an application that's very simple right now. It's just a sequence of steps. Uh, we did this because we programmed it by intention, right? Just because that's what we did. 
Uh, so this method calls these methods, these methods do the work. By the way, if we forgot to do that, or we were given code that somebody else wrote and they didn't do that, we would do a refactoring to get it there, which is called extract method. It's a pretty simple refactoring. Most IDEs will do it for you, right? Just highlight the code, say right click refactoring. So we either get it this way, or we put it into this shape after the fact. But it's good practice. But is it testable? See, programming by intention produces private methods, right? Because we're not trying to make the object more complicated from the outside. We're just trying to structure it in a way inside that's easier for us to understand. Well, it's kind of hard to write unit tests for private methods, right? TDD mavens would say that's not a problem because when you generated this, you had to have had a failing test. TDD says, you write code without a failing test, you're being malicious, right? So these methods were added as part of this behavior to make the test go green, they're covered. Well, that's a good point, and it's true most of the time. But it's also a very dogmatic point. And the fact of the matter is, there are times when, yeah, for the most part I agree, but darn it, uh, I want to test for that one. Maybe not those two, but that one just needs its own test. Okay, this is pressure from the test now, saying, well, look, if that should be tested by itself, maybe that's a clue that it doesn't belong in this class at all. Maybe it should be by itself, because it needs its own test. Often that's how we know how far we should go, is what do we need to do to make it testable. So let's say we decided to pull it out into a service. Now if we did that, one thing I'm definitely going to do is guard the constructor. Right? I'm going to give a get instance method, because I just, I just do that. I don't really think about it anymore, it's just kind of a practice. So that's what I'm going to do here, is I'm going to delegate from this object, and I can test it now, because it has a public API. Right? I needed it for him. And now it's reusable too. Right? A lot of other applications can use this too because it's been pulled out. But all of them, wherever I do this, are going to call the get instance method, which right now is simply implemented, implemented to do this. Now if nothing ever changes past this point, I'm good with it because it made it testable for me and the testability proof its reusability as well. So I've done something even more valuable than I thought I was doing. But maybe in the future we realize that this should have been more. We should have had an interface, we should have used a strategy pattern. We just didn't see it because, as has been pointed out, at that time we didn't understand the problem as well as we do now. Or the problem changed. So we say, okay, I wish we had an interface here. All right, well, the service can become the interface, as I mentioned before, with a single implementation. This is a refactor because we're still getting the same behavior all the time, which of course the test would reveal right now. But now it's open closed, which it wasn't before, right? That simple little extract interface refactor means I've got a clean way to add something else. And when I do that, of course, it doesn't affect anybody because what we change is the get instance method, right? To give you one or the other. And this might not be where we end either. Let's say somebody comes to you a few months down the road, in other words, where we open close to, right? And they say, we've got a new regulation from the federal government. When you're using this version of the tax policy, you just do it. But when you're using this version, you've got to write to a law. You've got to keep track of every use of that object. You know, the Congress just voted this in and we have to do this. Well, I don't want to add a new behavior to this object saying, before you do stuff, write to the law, because that's going to weaken its cohesion. But if you know patterns, and if this guy and all the other applications are protected from the reality here, then I can change this by putting on a proxy. A proxy pattern is basically add a behavior on top of an object or not, right? So here I'm going to say, this object's going to have this proxy sitting on top of it, which we talk through, so we have the logging done along the way. Uh, this one isn't, right? Because the legislation says, don't do that. Now, once I do this, this get instance method is not just a simple thing anymore. I've got some business rules, right? So now I think, actually, I probably should have some kind of factory where I can put those business rules. Well, I just created now. Because all I'm going to do from this guy is delegate to the factory rather than doing it myself. Again, no change here. And then maybe a little bit later, someone says, you know, we know we told you that you only log this service, but we've discovered there's times when you need to log this one too. This is the federal government, this is the state government talking, right? And by the way, it isn't only logging. Sometimes we need to validate what the service produces. Sometimes we need to authenticate before we use the service. In other words, there's a bunch of additional behaviors. Sometimes we use them all, sometimes we use none of them, and they could apply to either one. But this is not flexible. Well, we say, all right, it's time for the design to evolve again. So this thing that used to be the proxy, we'll just move the relationship, is now the decorator pattern. 
And we can put all those different behaviors as different decorators. And again, nothing happens over here. Now, what's the real advantage of saying, well, it is going to change something. You're going to change this guy, right? So what's, what's better about changing him than changing him? Kind of historically, we've noticed this. It seems to always be true. Once you build something of value, it tends to gain multiple clients over time. In fact, that's a good thing if it happens, right? Because it means it's really valuable if it's got multiple clients. The thing is, it almost never happens with the factories. They're always one thing. So do we have code maintenance here? Yeah, but at least it's in one place, and the factory doesn't do anything else but that. So the code is usually fairly simple and clean and easy to change, just making our lives easier. And remember, here's where we are now. That's where we started. So, Nagy, yeah, right? This is all empowering. So complexity is not evil. Sometimes we need complexity, but we don't want it until we actually need it, not in anticipation that we may need it. Good designs take the risk away of deferring that decision. Risk is wasteful, but so is over design. So that's why we need this butter zone between doing too much and not doing enough. So emergent design says the qualities define what good is. Principles guide us, not just about every decision we make. Practices protect us so that when you make the wrong decision, we can change it later, and disciplines empower us. But we'll end on this, and we'll take questions. All this is great, but at the end of the day, software is always going to be made by dedicated, professional, intelligent people who are working hard. So even though you do all this stuff right, you can't stop thinking. And I just ordered this t-shirt. You can't stop thinking, because I think it's pretty important. Okay, so just to wrap this up and then we'll open it up for general discussion. Um, this is the design pattern repository and objectives. Uh, this is where we put all the stuff we learned about patterns that maybe didn't come from the gang of four, like how do you test it, stuff like that. Uh, this is our resource section where you can find recordings of, well, talks like this one, but a whole bunch of other talks we've done, including every topic in this talk taken to a deeper level. And they're all there, you know, just for you to play back whenever you want to. They're not video, they're audio and PowerPoint on, uh, automation, animation. Um, this is what our design pattern repository looks like. Uh, this is what our resource section looks like. And by the way, the slides for this talk will also be posted at the site if you'd rather just have a PDF of the slides rather than recording them. Uh, this is just a bibliography. This is also available on our site. These are things that we think our books that teams should have. Um, we're doing some new webinars uh, coming up pretty soon, one on uh, Scrum and Kanban, uh, and another on shifting to Agile. Uh, these, generally speaking, are free, uh, and they're also recorded, so if you can't come, uh, you can always look at the recording afterwards. Uh, we're going to be at the Scrum Gatherings at, at Agile Development Better Software and at UberConf. It's one of my favorite conferences. If you get a chance to make it up to Denver, always go to UberConf. It's a great conference. They don't give you printed materials from the talks. Everybody gets an iPad at the beginning of the of the talk that has all the materials on it. It's a smart thing to do, of course you gotta give it back. So, pretty cool. Um, we have some public courses coming up. Uh, we're gonna do design patterns uh, in July in Seattle, and we're gonna do our uh, project management certification in September, although we don't exactly have a date yet. I will be teaching that course. So if you want to get a lot deeper on patterns, there's an opportunity for you. Uh, this is all the stuff and objectives. So this is mostly for the PDF. Uh, and this very pretty, uh, Description of our company, which I still think is a little bit hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Al likes that. <laughs> okay. I didn't quite make 45 minutes, but there were some questions during the talk, so that's probably why I didn't quite make 45 minutes. It was 45 minutes when I practiced. Anyway, um, questions? Nico. Scott, could you please uh, roll back over to where the webinars are so I can put one on my calendar? Yeah. Not really a question. That's okay. I mean, I went past too far. Where are the webinars, Scott? There. 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 As I said, these slides are also at our site, so you can just download them if you want that. So there's, you know, you covered a lot. Yeah. But the, you know, mile wide inch. PhD yeah. in software development. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, in a business, I mean, you always need good design. You, are we just saying, hey, your best people go attack this problem with your product, and you know the admin site part of your product? Eh, well, put the junior dev on it, maybe one other. I mean, this, so, some other problems, but 
my answer to that is because there's uh, no sort of prescription about yeah. there's just do all this stuff, but do you always do all this stuff? You... Well, it's about risk mitigation. Uh, good design mitigates risk. Right? That's what it's all about. So we talk about risk, you've got to talk about three dimensions of the risk. One dimension is if it goes wrong, how bad is that? Some things when they fail, it's no big deal. Right? So like uh, I'm a, I stubbed my toe right before the conference here. I stubbed my toe about three times a week. Uh, why don't I wear two steel tip shoes? Because stubbing your toe is not that bad, right? So you gotta first measure how bad of a bad is it, right? So that's one thing about risk. The second thing is about the likelihood of it happening, right? I mean, uh, if gravity turns off, that's really bad, right? But I don't put a bunch of footholds everywhere where I walk because it's not very likely to happen, right? So you gotta measure likelihood as well. And then the third thing is, how easy is it to mitigate? Uh, do I wear my seatbelt? Yes, I do. Because getting into a really bad car crash is likely? No. It's severe, <laughs> but not likely. But it's really easy to wear a seatbelt, so why shouldn't I? So I'm going to say that the quadrant we focus on is the things that are really important, really likely, and really easy to mitigate. The thing is, the more you learn about good practice like this, the more things are easy to mitigate. So if I can say, well, why not have a good design if it's not that hard to do? Then I say, well, then I don't necessarily have to thoroughly understand my risk. If you don't, if you don't have those in place and you're having to decide when it's worth it to put effort into design, you better understand your risks. And you might not. So it's risk mitigation. Well, thank you. Oh, no oh, it was a bit, a bit of a picky point, but on, I think it was slide 38, you were, you were using random numbers in a human text. Which, which, uh, and I was wondering whether you were really doing that or whether that was the, the NE class. Yeah, yeah. The NE? That's a, a whole topic, but okay. NE doesn't necessarily mean a random number. It means that I pulled the value out to communicate to somebody this value does not matter. Oh, okay. It might be a hard coded value, could be read from a, a testing script. Uh, random generation is a thing sometimes people say you should do. Uh -huh. That's too big a topic for me to get into in just a few minutes because it's important. Right? But the reason I used the any there was basically to say, uh, whatever values here is not the important part. Right. Uh, the test is about the behavior. Uh, I noticed that you're using uh, Java and C-sharp -like languages. Uh, how much have you thought about these principles? Or do you have any ways to think about these principles differently uh, for dynamic languages given their increasing popularity? Yeah, uh, I, I'm Mr. <laughs> strong type. Uh, because I want the computer to do most of the work. Uh, I understand that I'm not dissing anybody who's into rapid application development languages, um, but I, I think it has led us down some bad paths in the industry. Uh, so I'm not fond of them. However, those who are will tell you, and, and they could answer the question better than me, uh, there's versions of all of this uh, in dynamically typed languages and non-typed languages. The things just look different. You have different practices and different principles. But my focus, personally, is on strong typing because that's, I believe that is the thing that enables us to act in the most professional way. I'm wondering if it would be easier to refactor other people's code versus refactoring your own code. Hmm. No, my code's better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Refactoring other people's code. Well, this is all the, the, the what is legacy code? Code that tests. Code without tests. That's right. So if other people's code has tests and my code has tests, I don't think there's going to be a huge distinction between refactoring the two because the test will tell me what I need to know about the code even if I didn't write it. And I've got protection to make sure I am, in fact, refactoring it because that's what I intend. If the code doesn't have tests, I don't care whether I wrote it or you wrote it either, unless I wrote it five minutes ago, right? Because I've gotten away from it. So essentially, I would say the real question is whether you've got tests, not whether by the way, uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers is a great book. Because what he talks about is when you're given a big lump of code that's not tested, what are the minimalistic things you can do to get enough protection so that you can safely refactor it? And that's just a, a great topic because everybody's got that problem. Courageous book to write, too. A book about legacy code. Wow, glad you wrote it. All right, well, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. I'd like to thank you all for coming.